There's a reason why we all live in Florida right now, isn't there? <laughs> as far as gardening goes, we're not quite temperate, although we experience a lot of temperate climate, okay? And we're not quite tropical, although it'd be hard to convince someone it wasn't tropical in the middle of summer, okay? Uh, but we have a lot of tropical weather as well. So we get a lot, of, uh, a lot of wet weather. Sometimes we get all that wet weather at once. I don't know if you all pay attention to when the rain comes, but we had like a whole month of rain last year, June into July, like literally like every single day. And then some years I've been here, we have like eight weeks of drought where it doesn't rain, right? And then you can't keep plants alive in the, in the opposite direction of, of climate. So what I wanna talk about today are plants that are either native plants or Florida friendly, plants that come from parts of the world or parts of Florida um, or in a band that is a similar zone around the globe, okay? So we have some exotic plants that are considered Florida friendly because they come from another part of the world where they have a very similar climate condition. So they have evolved in a similar situation as the native plants here. So they're considered Florida friendly. So I would say a majority of our plants here, over time, um, the team here at Earthworks has kind of like a museum. We've curated a palette of plants that are easier to grow than others. I mean, we could carry a lot more plants um, that don't come from a similar zone that are tricky. We do carry a lot of tropicals here, you'll see those. Um, they're usually the most bold, um, vivacious plants that you'll see here. They catch your eye, you know, things like the bougainvilleas and the big tropical leafy plants. And there are special situations where we can use those. Um, but I certainly say if the plant's not Florida friendly or native, um, you, you take those plants and you don't put all your eggs in that basket, so to speak. You know, you use those as little touches here and there, but if you do your whole landscape with tropical plants, um, all it takes is one night and they're all gone. So last year, you might remember, we had low to mid 20s all over Jacksonville. And not only did it hit low to mid 20s, it stayed there for 10 to 12 hours, okay? And that decimated the beaches. The beaches area got hammered last year. Um, so if you were to take a walk in the, in the forest here, take a walk in the woods, um, those are gonna be your native plants, most of them. There are some invasives or some exotics that have crept in over the years. But if you wanna know what a Florida palette looks like, you can go um, to Hannah Park, for example. You can go up to the Talbot Island and those areas around the coast and see what's growing. Take a walk around UNF. They have a lot of trails with, uh, with just a natural habitat. There are a lot of places within walking distance, biking distance, driving distance, where you can see what our natural um, uh, native plants look like. So it all starts with soil. Have all of you, at least at this point, taken a shovel to the earth here since you've moved, okay? So if you put a shovel in the ground, it's just like loose sand, okay? We have varying degrees of that depending on which side of town we live on. If you were to take what we call soil here, um, our sand, and put it under a microscope, it's glass, okay? Not perfect glass balls, but it's glass, okay? So uh, I want you to imagine a colander, okay? Like you would put your pasta in. So you throw um, a couple big bags of marbles in there, okay? And that's our soil. And then you take a watering can, and you pour it over the marbles in that colander, what's gonna happen? It's gonna go right through, right? Okay, so when we're watering our gardens, when we're fertilizing our gardens, whatever we're putting in moves through it very quickly, okay? So we have to do something to slow the flow so that our plants can actually get some nourishment, get some moisture, um, to be able to not only survive here, but hopefully thrive, okay? So with our native plants, it's much easier for them because they're already used to growing in giant marbles, okay? So they're already used to it. But a lot of the other plants, even some of the Florida friendly plants, uh, we have to begin having some input, okay, into our soil so that the plants have a little bit more of an advantage, at least at, least at the very beginning so that they can get acclimated. Even our native plants, taking them out of one of these pots here and shoving them in the ground, all the roots are in that cylinder shape. And they're not really established until the roots start growing laterally across the ground, and that can take up to a year, all right? So if we're not doing something to help get them established, uh, we can have a month of rain, and that drought-tolerant plant, right, can turn to mush, okay? Because the roots are not used to getting a foot of rain in 30 days, all right? So we have to be doing little things to speed up the process of the roots expanding. So 
Fortunately, we have a lot of uh, different things we can do by using types of compost, which I'll be talking about some um, natural root stimulators that can speed up the process of our roots getting established. So that way, um, before the extreme events happen, the plants will have a, a more of an advantage to getting established in our, in our poor soil. All right, so back to the colander. So what can we do? So um, there are things like different types of compost mix. So I'm gonna pass these around. I wish this is what we found when we put our shovel into the ground, but it is not. I'll do two on each side here. If anyone wants to take this home, you're more than welcome when it gets to the end. But this is, this is more of what you would find in the forest, okay? So we have our colander here full of marbles, and over here we have the forest, right? So the forest is our kind of our benchmark for plant health. So the forest takes care of itself, right? Our lawn, our garden does not take care of itself. Why is that? Why doesn't our garden do what the forest does? Well, there's a lot of different variables, but the biggest thing is, is most, most of us live in communities and we live in, in a culture where it's not appropriate or we don't prefer that our front yard looks like a forest. Okay, so if our front yard was a forest or looked like a forest, it would take care of itself much better because what the forest does is it feeds itself by making its own food, right? The leaves fall, the branches fall, eventually the birds and the squirrels fall, and they all become compost and they all become soil, right? And they all feed the plants. But what do we do in our lawns and gardens? We take everything out, okay? We mow the lawn, we bag it. That's a huge nutrient loss right there, okay? We take the bag, put them in plastic, the, the, the grass, we put them to the side of the road. When the leaves fall, what do we do? We rake them up and we remove them. We're constantly taking everything out so that colander full of marbles never has anything getting in the nooks and crannies to hold the nutrients and hold the moisture in place, right? So that's one thing we can do that costs no money, okay? So every so often we can mulch our grass clippings, we can mulch our leaves, you know, leave them where they lay and mow over them, okay? Even if every so often it might take one or two passes, but we mow over them, they break down, and they start to create what's called topsoil, or like a compost layer on the top of our soil. How many, how many of you have sod or lawn in your yard? All of you? Okay. I've been doing this long enough in Florida to where I can safely say that lawn is a reoccurring cost. It's a reoccurring issue. It's a reoccurring frustration. It's a reoccurring problem that we insist on having, or our HOA insists on us having this green, lush lawn that does not want to grow here. It just doesn't. I'm just telling you guys, all right? So it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a process where we have to figure out how can we keep our lawn looking nice and try and do as little as possible to keep it looking that way because it could, you, you could have a, a full-time job keeping the lawn looking good if you want to keep it perfect. And I will tell you, even if you're paying someone else to take care of it and they're doing everything that needs to be done, it can still fail, even when you're doing everything right, okay? There's a lot of things that our lawn um, struggles with. So insects, fungal diseases, pests, we have, we have insects that like to eat our lawn, okay? It's crazy. So we have bugs that are out there that want to eat it. We have fungus that's out there trying to destroy it. We have hard frost that can knock it back. We have a month of rain that can cause all these fungal diseases to, to pop up. So the way we have to look at it is what can we do proactively to minimize the occurrence of these types of issues from happening over and over and over again. So the one thing that we've already touched on was the input. We have to be returning nutrients back into it. Now, if we're just spraying uh, chemicals in there, the chemicals are gonna move through quickly, okay? And the chemicals move through quickly, they eventually hit the water table or they hit a stream or a retention pond and they move away. And just like all roads lead to Rome, all streams lead back to the river or to the ocean eventually, right? So we hear about, yes, sir? Is it smart to add topsoil to here? It is smart, yeah. Yeah, so by top dressing, I and mean, we'll be talking about that, so the first thing that we top dress with is our lawn clippings themselves, okay, which is a natural form of nitrogen, which is basically all a lawn really, really needs. They do need all the nutrients um, that other plants need, but nitrogen is the big one 
for lawns, okay? And so the grass clippings themselves hold that. The dried leaves from trees that fall hold a lot of carbon, and plants are carbon-based just like we're carbon-based. Carbon is what also, when it's released into the atmosphere, causes issues. So by trapping the carbon back into the soil, um, we're actually keeping it where it belongs. So carbon belongs in the ground, carbon belongs inside plants, carbon belongs inside of us, carbon does not belong in the atmosphere, okay? So it really needs, we need to be returning it back to the earth, not putting it in plastic bags if at all possible. Um, so he mentioned topsoil. Topsoil is a very good option because anything that we're putting in that's dark, rich, and has the ability to hold on to nutrients and water is going to give our lawn, our gardens, a huge advantage. So just by thinking differently, rather than taking everything out, we're thinking about putting things in, okay, that are natural ingredients that we already have that we're not even paying for, okay? Now on top of that, I passed around those little cups. Um, we do have um, what's called command. And this can be added to your lawn or to your garden. So we have this dark, rich, crumbly mix. It's full of um, living organisms as well. So we're ta we talked about the colander in the forest. So what the colander doesn't have is microbiology, okay? So there are millions and billions of microbes in the forest floor, and there's also beneficial funguses in the forest floor. So there have been a lot of advances in plant science and plant biology. Uh, we have recently discovered in just the last 10 years that plants um, not only communicate um, with chemicals um, in the air to each other, they actually communicate with insects. So for example, a plant is being attacked by a pest. It emits a chemical that alerts all the other plants around it that it's being attacked. They start building up their defenses. Different types of chemicals then start moving from the roots up through the plant. Those same chemicals that they're emitting, the insects that eat the pest sense that and they come and they start eating the insects that are attacking the plant. Okay? That's one way they communicate. They also, we used to think because humans are so competitive, we have a worldview that everything else is very competitive too but we have found that plants are actually much more cooperative in nature. So what we have found is there was a scientist and she um, was putting chemicals into plants, um, into individuals. To, she had a theory that they shared chemicals and they shared nutrients. And so she'd put them into one and then she would test all these other plants and found that they were also getting those chemicals through the plant that she had put that nutrient into and she was doing radioactive uh, testing and she was finding that those nutrients were then being shared because that plant didn't need all those. So when plants get excess nutrients, they will pass them on to the plants around them. They have found that mother trees, that we have a, a concept now of a mother tree. Earthworks is also providing a $500 gift card to the winner of the Outstanding River Friendly Yard Award Contest. It's a contest promoted by the St. John's River Keepers Organization. 